Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of June 10th, 2013. This week's case was sent to us all the way from Dallas. This was sent by paramedic Lamar Adams, who is a paramedic at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, a very, very big airport. I'm sure they see a ton of great cases out there, and that certainly keeps them busy, seeing so many folks coming in from all over the world and also heading out to all over the world. Anyway, uh, Lamar got called to uh, take care of a patient who was kind of stuck in her car. She was a 54-year-old woman who was complaining of some chest pain, shortness of breath, and she couldn't really move her legs. Now, it wasn't clear whether she was totally paralyzed uh, in her legs or just simply couldn't move them. They were too weak. But uh, anyway, let's move on. She was sitting in the car, and she looked pretty sick. She was diaphoretic. She had respiratory distress. She was breathing probably in the upper 20s or so. She was a bit hypertensive, but her heart rate, on the other hand, was in the 50s. And uh, so, you know, think about what's going on here for just a second. You think about your differential for chest pain, shortness of breath, and gosh, inability to uh, really get out of her car. And she's looking pretty bad. She's real short of breath and so on. Well, the first thing you're going to do is, well, maybe not the first thing, but very soon you're going to get a 12 lead EKG, especially since this is a video series on EKGs, right? So you're going to get a 12 lead EKG quickly, and here it is. And just quickly looking at the 12 lead EKG, it doesn't look all that bad, right? Looks pretty normal, except for that STEMI. So there's clearly evidence of an inferior wall STEMI. There's very nice ST elevations as ST elevations go. There's also some reciprocal changes in the uh, inferior lead, or I'm sorry, in the lateral leads, one in AVL. And that's very typical for inferior STEMIs to produce reciprocal changes in leads one in AVL, especially AVL. We've, I think we've talked about that before. And just to really kind of suck out all the stuff that we can from this 12 lead EKG, when you're dealing with an inferior wall STEMI, there's a couple of places that you worry about extension. You worry about posterior extension of an inferior MI, and you worry about right ventricular extension of an inferior MI. With posterior extension, you're going you're gonna to look for ST segment depression in V1, V2, V3, uh, if it's been more than maybe a couple hours, you're going to look for tall R waves. This is probably a little bit early for that. And you're also going to look for upright T waves. And these are inverted T waves, and there's not significant ST depression. So I'm thinking it's probably not posterior MI. You're also going to worry about right ventricular MI. And the simplest way to find out if somebody's having a right ventricular MI is to do right-sided leads. Again, we've talked about that as well. And that's going to be important because if there is evidence of a right ventricular MI, you're going to try to stay away from preload reducing medicines like nitrates and hang a bag of fluids and be ready to go if they drop their blood pressure. Another clue that might suggest right ventricular MI is if you have ST segment elevation in V1 combined with ST segment depression in V2. That simple combination in the presence of an inferior STEMI is very predictive of right ventricular involvement. Well, we really don't see those, okay? And uh, so, you know, maybe there's right ventricular MI, we'll, we'll maybe check a 12 lead EKG, but you know, there's something funny going on here. Here's a patient with an inferior STEMI, all right, no problem there, but she's in respiratory distress. It's not common for inferior STEMIs to give you respiratory distress, right? Uh, you can develop respiratory stress with an MI if you're in pulmonary edema, but those are usually really big MIs involving the lateral leads. Inferior STEMIs, even if they extend to the right ventricle, are they might make you hypotensive, but they're not going to fill your lungs with fluid. You're going to have clear lungs, and so you're not going to really be in respiratory distress. Um, one, one other thing that's notable is, remember, she's hypertensive. That's a bit unusual. So there's a couple of unusual things going on here. She's got an inferior STEMI, and yet she's hypertensive. Usually inferior STEMIs are hypotensive or, or at least normotensive. Hypertension, that's a bit unusual. We mentioned already this respiratory distress with an inferior MI. That's a little unusual. And then an MI with neurologic symptoms, that's kind of unusual also. Well, we'll move forward. Uh, 
Lamar got this patient up to uh, a cath center very quickly, and he sent me some statistics about what they normally do at uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. He said that on average they have uh, a door-to-balloon time or, or maybe paramedic-to-balloon time of something ridiculous like 35 minutes. It's amazing. If you're going to have an MI, make sure that you're in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and Lamar and his buddies are working. Okay, that's I think that's the takeaway point. I'll have to put that on the last slide. But anyway, they sent this patient up for a rapid PCI. And I keep thinking about what's going on. And I'll give you another hint. This is more than just an EKG case, all right? So the patient goes up for a cath. And what did they see? Well, hopefully you kind of guessed what was going on. This patient's got a thoracic aneurysm. And for anybody that is not good at reading angios like me, uh, this is a clue, okay? So this is a thoracic aneurysm. By the way, I got this picture off the internet. Uh, I, I don't have a really good original picture of this patient. Uh, so this was taken off the internet, but essentially the patient's got a thoracic aneurysm and squirt some more dye. It turned out that she's got a dissection through that aneurysm as well. And it was a fairly extensive, this is also off the internet, by the way, not a real uh, from this patient. Uh, so this patient had a dissecting aneurysm. Now, before we go forward, let me just share with you a little bit of a pet peeve, just a little pet peeve, and that is oftentimes people use the term dissecting aneurysm, and in reality, a thoracic aneurysm and a thoracic aortic dissection are two different things. Most dissections are not aneurysms, okay? And most aneurysms don't dissect. But in some cases, if you're having a really bad day, you'll have an aneurysm and a dissection through that aneurysm. And that's exactly what happened here. So again, back to my little pet peeve here. Thoracic aneurysms like triple A's tend to cause rupture, not dissection in most cases, two different conditions. But in this case, the patient did have an aneurysm and it did dissect. And that largely explains the combination of symptoms that she has. Now, we're going to talk just for a moment about dissection. We're getting away from the EKG. Uh, hopefully, people won't mind. People have emailed and said that they want to talk about cases and not just EKGs. So we'll do that every now and then. And this is a great case because it has to do with the heart. Take a look at the aorta, the aortic arch, big red as it's sometimes called. And when a person's got a dissection, you can have all kinds of wacky symptoms, right? If you have a, uh, a proximal dissection involving the beginning part of the aorta, also referred to as a Stanford type A dissection, A for ascending, if it extends up into one of the carotids or up into the brain, you can end up dissecting off a cerebral uh, artery and that can give you stroke symptoms. Okay, so a dissection can produce stroke symptoms with hemiplegia. It can dissect backwards and knock out the right coronary artery and produce a, an inferior STEMI, which is exactly what happened here. It can dissect backwards and produce diffuse ischemia, which can produce ST depressions all over the place. If it dissects backwards, it can knock out the aortic valve and produce a new diastolic murmur, in other words, aortic regurgitation. It can dissect backwards and produce a tamponade. And in fact, that's how most dissection patients die. They die of tamponade from proximal dissection. They develop a rapid pericardial tamponade, hemorrhagic effusion, hemorrhagic tamponade, and they die. And that's why dissection patients can sometimes be hypotensive. They're not all hypertensive. All right, they can die of, of uh, tamponade. And heading the other way, if your dissection heads south, down the descending aorta, it can knock out a renal artery and produce a dead kidney. It can go down and knock out an iliac artery or both iliacs or one of the uh, other distal vessels and produce a dead leg, pulseless leg. Patients may not be able to move. And uh, what else? It can also dissect, you don't see the spinal cord here, but it can dissect backwards into a spinal artery, which is behind the heart here. And if it dissects backwards into a spinal artery, you can have a paraplegia. So think about all the different things that dissection can do. It can produce stroke symptoms. It can produce aortic regurgitation, inferior STEMI or tamponade. It can produce 
renal failure, acute renal failure. It can produce a dead leg, probably a dead arm also if it heads out that way. And it can also go down the spinal column and produce paraplegia. So a lot of times people refer to dissection as the great imitator or uh, a syphilis mimicking type of thing, right? The great imitator. And it can mimic an awful lot of things. And that's why it's really important to remember this. So some quick take home points. This is a great case that Lamar sent us because it gave us a chance not only to look at an EKG, which is honestly pretty easy in this case, but also to review something that can sometimes be associated with the nasty looking EKG. And is certainly in that differential for anybody with chest pain. Uh, dissections can produce a STEMI. Now it's not that common only about 4 to 8%, according to the literature, of thoracic dissections will produce a STEMI. And if it's a STEMI, it usually is an inferior STEMI. Nothing in medicine is 100%, but usually this is an inferior STEMI because it's knocking out the right coronary. It can also produce diffuse ischemia with ST depressions all over the place. And then a couple other pearls that I always uh, would say, chest pain plus neurologic symptoms, dissection. Chest pain plus new diastolic murmur, dissection. New renal failure, dissection. Ischemic extremity, dissection. And also remember it can produce a pericardial effusion. All right, so great case, very important case. And my thanks to Lamar for sharing that case with us. And uh, again, we'll try to discuss a little bit more cases in the coming weeks and month rather than just focusing on the 12 lead EKG if people want. Otherwise, we'll just focus on EKGs. I'll do whatever you want. All right. Just about anything within reason. All right. So thanks again.